Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heidzik. We're so glad you joined us today. As people of God, we are part of a spiritual kingdom even as we live in the world. Jesus will ultimately establish his kingdom on earth, but until then, we are called to be his ambassadors here and now. In this series, Pastor Skip explores what it means to occupy till he comes. We are continuing in this series, Kingdom City, and uh, this message is called Be a Kingdom Influencer, Matthew chapter 5. So what persuades a person to say yes to anything? Well, that is the power of influence, and that has been actually studied over the last six decades. How do you get a person to move from one position to another position and say yes. Now, persuasion is all around us. It's on billboards, it's in music, it's in pictures, radio, television, internet, social media. There's always people persuading us or trying to, uh, to a certain position. Um, Have you ever been talked into buying something? You know, they they were so good at their job, and you walked out of the store going, you know, I don't think I really needed that, but here it is. And uh, you wonder how that happened. Even if you do the research and you look at all the YouTube videos to see if you really want that product, somebody in one of those videos just talked you in to getting that thing. So you were persuaded. Now, most of the people who persuade us or influence us when we're young are parents, brothers, and sisters. Uh, My earliest influences were um, my brothers. My brother Jim gave me a love for photography. My brother Rick got me interested in guitars and music. My brother Bob got me interested in uh, motorcycles. And my parents influenced me to like yard work. I didn't like it when they asked me to do it, but I do now. I was influenced by them. When I met my wife, Lenya, for the first time, I became an influencer. I had to think, how can I influence that young lady to make the decision yes when I ask her to marry me? That's, that's what I turned into, an influencer. Influence and an influencer has become sort of a social media term more lately. It is uh, adopted by them. How, how do we get people online to, with their audience, sway their audience to engagement? How do we get them to buy our product? How do we get them to pay for our service? So those are called influencers, and it's actually a very lucrative position. I found out that you can make up to about 200,000 a year if you're a really successful social media influencer. How many of you knew that? You can make that kind of money. That's a, that's a, that's a boatload. So we are, we are all influencers to someone, as well as being influenced by people, we are also persuaders, influencers. We have an audience, we have, we have a network, we have a sphere of influence, could be our kids, could be coworkers, could be on social media. When it comes to influence, here's the question I pose to you. Do you want to be like a tumbleweed or do you want to be like an oak tree? That's actually from a quote I'm going to put up on the screen and we're going to look at it together. Galen Anderson wrote, a man's life is like either the tumbleweed or the oak tree. Some people just grow like the weed. They are of no value in their youth, and as the years of life come, they break loose and become a blotch on society. They have no useful purpose in life, just drifters. Their loved ones will mourn their loss, but society will not miss them. Then there are those whose lives are like the oak, They have turned from the frivolity of this life and have invested in the things that have genuine worth. 
their influence for good will live on in the lives of others after they are gone. Their death is noticed because their lives were spent bettering the nation and the community. They will be missed. So do you want to be tumbleweed or oak? Yeah, I'm guessing the oak tree. You want to have lasting influence and impact. Well, the next question is, uh, for what? What is it exactly that you want to influence people about or for? What cause are you influencing others toward? With that in mind, let's look at our text. Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus speaking says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, Jesus is speaking here in what is called the Sermon on the Mount. I've never liked the title, by the way. Um, the Bible didn't call it that. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. That's like saying that the title of my message is the Sermon from the Pulpit. So this really was the sermon about the kingdom. That's what it was about, the sermon on kingdom living. And he is speaking to a crowd. In the crowd are his disciples, He has his disciples in mind when he shares these words. The disciples were, uh, from what region did they come from? Anybody know? Galilee. Galilee. Galilee was like the country. Uh, It was a rural area, not a city area. They were blue-collar workers. They were like normal folk. They were uh, farmers, fishermen, peasants, and their lives would have seemed to them insignificant in the light of the Roman Empire that was in control of that land. In, in, in fact, they may have even asked themselves, how could I ever make a difference in this empire, in this world? Which I believe is a question we all ask. How can I make a difference in the world in which I live? We should be asking that question. So what I want to do with these verses is give you three reasons why you can and should make a difference in the world in which you live, for three reasons. The conditions are right, the commission is clear, and the caution is plain. First of all, let's look at the conditions. You'll notice in our paragraph that Jesus Uh, in verse 13, uses two analogies, two metaphors. The first one is salt. The second one is light. Those are metaphors. Those are analogies. We know that our Lord did this a lot. He taught with illustrations. He taught in parables. So he begins the Sermon on the Mount giving pithy little statements, blessing statements. We call them beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He describes in the Beatitudes the character, the nature of kingdom followers, of followers of him. They're like this. That's their character. Now, with this analogy, with these metaphors, he tells you what his kingdom followers do in the world in which they live. They are like salt, and they are like light. And I've always loved this about Jesus, the fact that he uses illustrations to get a a point across. Uh, Jesus put, like we like to say, he put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Anybody can understand this. Anybody can grasp this. Remember, Jesus said, feed my sheep, not feed my giraffes. And he was really good at feeding sheep, right, just getting it down to where everybody could understand what he was meaning. So he, in his teaching here, uses two simple analogies from the natural world, salt and light. 
by using these analogies, he is implying something about the world itself. He doesn't have to say it explicitly. It is a presupposition. The fact that he said, you are the salt and you are the light of the world implies something about the world. Now I'm going to ask you this. How would you describe your world? How would you describe your state, your country, the world in which you live? You hear the news reports. You know what's going on in the world. So if you were to describe your world, would you say it's peaceful, it's righteous, it's decent, it's filled with good? Or might you use terms like it's corrupt, it's dark, it's evil, it's bad? You see, by using these terms, they themselves speak a lot about the world. Look at the first one. You are the salt of the earth. By using that term, Jesus is implying the world is decayed and rotten and needs help. You know, we use the term salt of the earth. I've heard people use that. Oh, he's the salt of the earth. Usually what we mean by that is he's honest, he's upright, he's simple, um, a straightforward, friendly, you know, just a salt of the earth guy. However, when Jesus uses the term, it has a different meaning. Salt was used in ancient times to stop meat from getting rotten. They would rub the salt in the meat because meat, if you leave it out, will smell pretty rank in a couple of days. So they had no refrigerators, they had no freezers. To prevent decay, to stop bacterial rot, they would rub salt into the meat. Ever smelled old rotten meat? Ever open your refrigerator one day and go, man, that's been in there way too long? You smell it, right? And then you might even make the mistake of taking it out of the fridge and putting it in the trash, which makes everything worse because now it doesn't even have that low temperature of a refrigerator. The corruption process is faster. So everything smells. So think of that smell when you hear this phrase, you are the salt of the earth. When I was in high school, I worked at a place called Hugo's Delicatessen. It was an Italian family, and they uh, we had meat, and they had a drink cooler, and I would sometimes cut the meat, and our boss was very finicky about cleaning up every speck of meat in the corner on that stainless steel countertop because if you didn't, if you left some meat like it fell on the floor or got into the cracks, you'd smell it the next day or the next couple of days. So you are the salt of the earth. You stop the rot, the corruption in the world around you. Second, you are the light of the world. Now, this implies the world is in darkness. Go back in your minds 2,000 years. Uh, did they have electricity back then? Nope, they had no electricity. We do today. We enjoy light in a room. Nighttime doesn't change much for us. You go into well-lit homes. You're able to cook meals, read books, uh, play with your kids because you're in a world of lights. You go get in your vehicle, your vehicle has lights to navigate through the darkness. And then there are lights out on the street, just so you have a relative idea of what is going on in your environment. Not 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, uh, when it was dark, everything stopped. People went inside, and they lit little oil lamps about the size of your hand, a little clay lamp, and they would then lift it onto a shelf, a stone shelf in the home, pretty high up to give light to the room. So, when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, the implication of Christ is this. He is saying the world is corrupt, decayed, rotten, and dark. Jesus, tell us how you really feel right? Now, I don't know if you agree with that assessment. That is Jesus' assessment. That happens to be a biblical worldview. The world is dark. The world is corrupt. In fact, in school, I remember them telling us that 
people lived in the dark ages before the age of enlightenment. What I've discovered is every age is dark. The enlightenment they're speaking about is, is like just book knowledge. You know, we're enlightened. We learn more, so we're enlightened. But every age of man, whether you're smart or not smart, is dark apart from Christ and needs light. And by the way, you should know this, it is not getting better, it's getting worse. Sometimes people say, well, we're evolving upward. Really? Do you read anything? Do you ever watch a newscast? You think we're getting better? We're not getting better, we're getting worse. Yes, we have better technology, so we're learning how to kill people easier and faster. But that's not improving mankind in our nature. Paul said to Timothy, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. So I'm painting a black picture for you for this reason. The conditions are perfect. Just perfect for salt and light to make an impact. The conditions are right. Salt and light, because it's corrupt and dark, can make maximum impact. The darker the night, the brighter the light. So we often complain, the world is so bad. Yeah, it needs some good. It needs some salt. It needs some light. Yeah, but if you looked around lately, we're, it's such a mess. Every time you hear the word mess, I want you to think of something else. Message and messenger. The world is a mess. It needs a messenger with a message in the mess. That's salt and light. Conditions are perfect for us. This is where we come in. So let's, let's look at the second. First is the conditions are right. The second is the commission is clear. What's the commission? Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men. Every now and then in the Bible, you read a statement that makes you stand up straight. Lift your head up high and go, wow, I'm important. This is one of those statements. If there ever was a statement that should cause you to realize what a remarkable thing it is to be a Christian, it's the statement, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. Because when our Lord said that, and Matthew wrote it down, he used an emphatic plural. Plural, y'all. But it's emphatic, so it's you and you alone are the salt of the earth. You and only you are the light of the world. So to put it all together, by implication and by statement, Jesus is saying, yep, the world is rotten. Yep, the world is dark. But I have a plan, and you're it. My plan is you. You're the only hope this world will ever have. If you don't be salt and you don't be light, there's no hope. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. You and you only. Now, how does that make you feel when you hear it like that? Some of you will say, it makes me feel really pressured. Like there's a lot hanging on me. It, it makes me really stressed out. How about this? How about this? should make you feel important. Yeah. should make you feel valuable. In fact, I didn't tell you this, salt was so valuable in ancient times, it was like money. Roman soldiers were often paid with salt. Ever hear the phrase, he's not worth his salt? You know where that comes from? It comes from that practice of paying Roman soldiers with quantities of salt, because salt held its value. It was so valuable. In fact, we get the word soldier from two words, sal dare, which literally means to give salt. And our word salary, somebody who's paid a salary, comes from the word giving salt. So we have a commission. 
in a dark world, in a corrupt world, to be salt and light. Now, I want to drill down on that a little bit. What does that mean exactly? What does this mean practically? What does it mean practically to be salt and light in the world in which we live? How can we make a difference? Let me give you a few ways. Number one, we disinfect. We disinfect the world. Just like salt was used to stop corruption, rubbed into meat to preserve it, to disinfect the meat, the bacterial rot that was in the meat, that's what we do. We disinfect. Also, I didn't tell you this, but I will now, salt was used for medicinal purposes. It was a medicine. It was put in a wound to take away infection. It was rubbed on babies when they were born to also take away bacteria on the skin. In Ezekiel 16, God says to the people of Israel, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, you were not washed with water to clean you, you were not rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloth. So there was a common practice when a baby was born to take salt and rub to keep the corruption away, to disinfect the baby, so to speak. So what do we do? We disinfect. Christians are to be a moral disinfectant, a spiritual preservative to retard or stop spoilage in this world. Hey, you think it's bad now? Imagine how bad the world will be when all of the salt is instantly removed at the rapture of the church. No one to say, that's not going to happen. No one to stop the onslaught of immorality. All the Christians are gone during the tribulation. It will only take seven years for the world to get so bad, God has to wipe it out. It rots very, very quickly. So we disinfect. We have a job of disinfecting our culture. And by the way, I've told you this on several occasions. Every past revival I have ever studied has moral benefits to it as well. Yes, people are saved. Yes, people come to Christ. Their lives are changed. But because their lives are changed, they build hospitals. They start orphanages. They start educational systems for young children. They better the society in which they live. Now, some of you might be uh, thinking ahead of me and you're saying, okay, well, if, if we do that much good, if Christians do that much good in society, uh, why aren't we appreciated more, right? Why, are they, why do they always marginalize us or talk down about us? Well, I'm glad you asked. What happens when you pour salt into an open wound? It disinfects it, but it also, yeah, People don't go, ah, they go, ouch, it hurts. So when you and I, as that moral, spiritual disinfectant in our culture, speak up or do good, um, it's not going to be without certain repercussions. That's what disinfectants do. You may want to ask yourself on a personal level, when was the last time your presence stopped corruption. Or I'll put it another way. Do your friends find it easy to tell you a dirty joke? Or hard? Oh, here's Skip. Don't tell him that joke. He won't like it. Or here's Skip. He'll love that joke. So we disinfect. Second, we add flavor. Just like salt adds flavor. Sometimes food by itself is pretty boring, pretty insipid. You know, we in New Mexico have taken it to the extreme. It always has to be red or green, not just salt, red or green. That brings out the flavor. Well, in many cultures, for many years, salt is used to bring out the flavor, to take the tastelessness out of the food and to enrich the flavor. Like food, life can be flat, insipid, vapid, boring, empty. People get burned out. For this reason, people seek pleasure. For this reason, people develop habits. For this reason, people get addicted on their way to trying to add flavor to their life. But when they can see a person who has real joy, real purpose, 
real peace, real confidence, flavor, if you will. Wow, that's different. They seem so filled with flavor. Remember what Paul said in Colossians 4? Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. So we disinfect, we add flavor. A third practicality. We create a thirst. Christians should be creating a thirst. Now, thirst is just the result of salt doing its job. If you put salt on something, you have sodium in something, you get thirsty. Salt tablets are often given to soldiers, hikers, because the saline, the sodium, the the salt will help deliver hydration to the cells. A low-sodium diet, if it's too low, can actually promote dehydration. So we need water, and salt does that. I'll, I'll make a confession. Um, please forgive me, but I'm, I'll be honest with you. I, I did a practical joke. This was many years ago, though. <laughs> Decades, actually. I'm trying to distance myself a little bit from what I'm about to tell you. So I was at lunch with a friend. I was saved. I was a pastor. And I, I had one of my associate pastors at lunch, and uh, he ordered something. I ordered something. He ordered a Coke, but then he said, I'm going to get up and use the restroom. So he went into the restroom While he was in the restroom, I took the salt shaker, opened it up, and poured a bunch of salt in his Coke and stirred it up. So he came back and and, and drank some. He goes, well, it tastes a little bit funny, but okay. And he he kept drinking and kept drinking. And he goes, man, I'm really thirsty. He kept drinking, thinking it's going to satisfy his thirst. But the more he drank, the thirstier he got. When he got to the very bottom of a very large cup, I finally said, okay, I, I pulled a joke on you. I put a whole bunch of salt in there. Hated it. So, yes, that's me. I confess that to you now. (laughs) Point is, the salt was doing its job. The salt creates thirst. It, uh, It increases a craving for water. Likewise, this world is spiritually dehydrated. It's thirsty. Do you realize that you, by your life, can create a thirst? Your presence can create a thirst? You say, how is that possible? Here's how. Live such a full Christian life that when others see your life, their life seems flat, tasteless, and empty. You are living such a full, flavorful life that they get thirsty around you. Your life is attractive to them. We create a thirst. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the things that you do, by the words that you say. People hear what you say, and they see what you do. So what is the gospel according to you? Are you making them thirsty? So we disinfect, we add flavor, we create thirst. Fourth, we dispel darkness. That's the role of light. Salt By its properties, the effect is often hidden, not so with light. Light is more obvious. It dispels darkness. Darkness, metaphorically, scripturally, and analogously, uh, speaks of ignorance, especially spiritual ignorance, wickedness, evil, sin, whereas light speaks of truth. Peter said, we were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. But here's the thing about light. Has to be seen. Has to be seen. You don't light a lamp and then cover it up. That's what Jesus said. You don't turn on the lights in your room and then quickly get cardboard and cover over the light fixture. It would be dumb. It would be useless. Be pointless. Be impractical. So verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You can still go to Galilee today and see the city Jesus was referring to. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So they take the oil lamp, put it up high on that shelf so you can see inside the room. Light, by its very nature, demands visibility. Because by it, everything else is visible. So all of that to say this, the Christian life is to be lived out in the open, in public. 
What, what are we to do? In a nutshell, turn on the light. We turn on the light. There's no such thing as secret discipleship. Oh, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm a secret agent Christian. Nobody knows I'm saved. Well, that's a problem. Everybody should know that you're saved. It's impossible to be a secret disciple. The secrecy will kill the discipleship, or the discipleship will destroy the secrecy. Turn on the light. Dispel the darkness. But I'll warn you, when you turn on the light, it will reveal the dark spots. And just like if you put salt in a womb, uh, a womb, a wound, don't put a salt in a womb. <laughs> if you put salt in a wound, it hurts. When you turn on lights, when people get accustomed to darkness, they squint. It hurts. You reveal something about their lives that they're not wanting to look at. So just keep that in mind. You dispel the darkness, but the first reaction is not going to be pleasant. But that leads me to the fifth and final part of this commission. We disinfect, we add flavor, we create thirst, we dispel darkness. But we just don't dispel the darkness. We show the way out of darkness. You take a flashlight and you can shine it in somebody's face and reveal the problem, or you can say, come here, let me show you how to get out of this. You point the way out. It doesn't just dispel darkness, it shows the way out. Isaiah chapter 9, speaking of Christ and being in Galilee, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. So you're going to help. It's talking about Christ being born to help navigate people out of the darkness. My wife, Lenya, grew up in Ludington, Michigan, and she has this beautiful lighthouse in her hometown, right on the shore of Lake Michigan. It's the delight of everybody in that town. It's what people many times will go to Ludington, Michigan to see, the lighthouse on the break wall. You can see the lights from the shore, but the lights aren't there for people on the shore. They're there to navigate or help boats navigate into the harbor at night when it's dark to show them safe harbor, to help them get out of a difficult situation. So our task is all of these, our commission, all of the above. There was a little boy who was with his father in a cathedral in Europe. They were visiting this beautiful church filled with stained glass windows, and uh, boy loved it. He'd never seen so many cool windows of objects and people, and they were pointing out, well, that's Saint so-and-so in that window, and that's Saint so-and-so, and Saint this and that, and went on and named them all. When the boy got home and he went to Sunday school class, the teacher happened to ask the class, does anybody here know what a saint is? And the little boy said, I know what a saint is. A saint is a person the light shines through. He was thinking back to those stained glass windows and the sun coming through that personage on the window. A saint is a person the light shines through. We dispel darkness. We show people how to get out of it. It's our task. It's our commission. Third is the caution. Now go back to verse 13. After Jesus introduces the analogy of salt, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men quite a statement. Now, is that even possible for salt to get unsalty? Well, a couple thousand years ago, most of the salt or much of the salt came from the area around the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is 25% saline, and so with evaporation, they would harvest the salt on the shore, but it often became contaminated with gypsum and other materials, so it was not preferred. 
But I was reading yesterday in my library how that salt actually can become unsalty. So I was reading a book that I happen to have. It was printed in 1874. It is called The Land and the Book by Dr. William Thompson. And in his book, I was reading that he describes salt that was imported from Cyprus and stored on the floors of several buildings. And he said this, quote, The salt next to the ground in a few years entirely spoiled, and I saw large quantities of it literally thrown into the street to be trodden underfoot by men and beasts. It was good for nothing. End quote. So salt can lose its saltiness. When Jesus gives this warning, he is not speaking of losing your salvation. So if if that worries you, put that out of your mind. He's talking about losing your influence, losing your impact, losing your effectiveness. If you lose the very intention that I have you in this dark world for, Jesus said, it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Let me put it a different way. If you are so influenced by your culture that you no longer are an influence to your culture, then you become as insignificant as dust on the streets because you blend in. You blend in. Christians shouldn't blend in. A Christian should stand out. Salt is very different from the meat that it is rubbed into. Light is a very different substance, though it's in the same space. It is very different. I believe that one of the greatest endeavors, desires of our enemy, the devil, is to make us indistinguishable from the world. But so many times, that's what we want to do. Oh, i got to show people that I'm like them. I'm as cool as they are. I, I fit in and do what they do. Fitting in becomes more important than standing out. Not a good plan. Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. So if you don't want to waste your life, if you don't want to end up As a tumbleweed, if you want to be a life-giving oak, be salt, be light. That's your intention. Then verse 16 closes out this thought. Let your light, and yes, you have it, because you are the light of the world. By the way, just a note on that. Some of you are a little bit confused because you go, wait a minute, why am I the light of the world? Jesus said he was the light of the world. Think sun and moon. Jesus is the sun Light emanates from him. We are the moon. We reflect the light to others. So he said, I am the light of the world. Now he says, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your good works become the billboard by which you advertise your Christianity. Let your good works become the billboard by which you advertise your Christianity. They will see your life. They will be thirsty for what you have. You will disinfect their environment. You will emanate in that dark, befuddled area, and you will glorify your Father in heaven. By the way, you should know this. The reason we have so many practical opportunities at this church through the year to get involved. So many projects. You go, what, another project? We have OCC, Operation Christmas Child. We have a toy drive. We do Thanksgiving meals for the impoverished. We do school supplies for those who aren't doing well. We have a love bomb every year and collect money and supplies for that. Why? Because we can either complain about how dark this world is or we can turn the light on. That's why. We can either say, this world is rotten and corrupt, or we can rub salt in it and make a difference. 
Jesus did not say, let your complaining be heard before men. He didn't say that. He didn't say, let your picketing and demonstrating be seen before men. He did not say, let your anger be heard and seen before men. He just said, turn the light on. Rub the salt in. I read that during World War II, Europe was so dark because of the bombing, the electrical grid was taken out, that you could see a soldier lighting a cigarette a mile away. That's how dark it was. So it's pretty dark out there. Pretty dark in our world. Pretty dark in our state. Pretty dark in our culture. Pretty dark in our city. Pretty dark around the world. Perfect conditions for us. This is our greatest moment. That's what Kingdom City is all about. Rub the salt in the decay. Turn the light in the darkness. Show people how to get out of it. Evangelism, good works, all the above. Making Jesus famous, making his name great. Not just singing it in church, but taking it to the streets, in our family, in our neighborhoods. That's salt. That's light. And it's not just one person. It's all of us. The thing about salt is nobody just takes a grain of salt and puts it on their food. They take salt in combination with other granules. So it's not one person. It's all of us collectively spreading out through the community. You turn your light on. I'll turn my light on. We'll turn them on, whatever, in Starbucks, at the grocery store, at the community center. The light will shine. People will change. It's so messy. Yep, it needs a message and a messenger. And that's us. Something else. Some people come to church because the light's good. The light's better. It makes them feel good. It's like the guy that was looking for his car keys and uh, he was searching out under the street light and his friend said, did you lose your keys out here? He goes, no, I dropped them in the house, but the light's better here. <laughs> Some people come to church because the light's better there. Makes them feel good. They meet nice people. They make good contacts. And good, we're glad. For whatever reason you come, we're, we're honored to have you. We really are. But don't stop there. Step out of darkness into the light. If you haven't done that, we always like to give people an opportunity. Because every week it seems there's people who want to seize that opportunity. They realize their life isn't what it should be. They expected more out of life. It didn't deliver. And now they are searching. They're, they're thirsty. They're, they're, they want something more. There is something more. The light's good here, but I want to ask you if you're willing and ready to step out of your darkness into his light. Have flavor, purpose, meaning in your life. Everything can change. Maybe you have been religious all your life. You went to church, you believed in God in your head, but you didn't really do anything personal and practical and authentic and real. How about now? Now is as good a time to do it as any. In fact, perhaps it's the best time. You're not here by accident. You're here by appointment. I believe God brought you here, and that aching in your heart can be answered, can be resolved. The thirst that you have can be quenched. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and you can be satisfied. But you have to come to him to drink. So maybe you've never personally done that, or... You remember something you did when you were younger? You went to a church camp, you were at a service like this or at a concert, you felt really good inside, you said a prayer, but that was then, this is now. You've walked away from the Lord. You're not living that life that you know you should, that abundant life. You need to come home. You need to come back to him. You need to renew, rededicate your life. If either of those describe you, that can change. Let's pray. Father, the light is good here. There's a lot of bright lights in this room right now. Men and women, young and old, 
who do shine brightly in their families at their job in this city for your glory. But maybe some sensing that light and that salt, they're thirsty for more. They yearn for more. They want to experience more than they have experienced. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit, that third person of the Trinity, whose job it is, whose role it is, to convince people that they need Jesus, would be doing his work right now. And would draw men and women to this place of decision, of following the Savior that was sent for them to save them of their sin, to quench the thirst they have as humans in this life, to find meaning and purpose, peace and joy, something you want all of us to have, something it is possible to have even in a dark and corrupt world. We can have it. We can live it. I pray your Holy Spirit would convince people of that. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus personally. Not yes to church, not yes to a denomination, not yes to an organization. Yes to the person of Jesus Christ, the crucified, resurrected, living Lord of the universe who loves you passionately. God's not mad at you. God's madly in love with you. And if you're here today and you want to give your life to him, you're ready to do so. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'm going to leave mine open so I can see you do this. But if you're willing and ready to say yes to the Savior, I'd like you to raise your hand up so I can pray for you. I need to know who I'm praying for, so just raise your hand up. I'll identify you, and you can lower it. But put it up high so I can see it. God bless you in the very back. And on my left in the back and several of you on my left hand side right up here in the front and toward the middle on my right yes and yes and yes over here who else way in the back god bless you if you're in the balcony raise your hand up raise it up high who else if you're in the family room it's just glass I can see. Raise your hand up. Yes, awesome. Father, we pray for these dear people who have come. You love them. You are madly in love with them. You created them for a purpose. You want their lives to be full. You want them to experience more than just the humdrum of life. Father, we pray that as they give their lives to Jesus, from this day forward, everything would change. That's what you promised. You said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Everything becomes new. I pray they'll experience that. I pray a burden will be lifted in their lives. I pray for your peace to overshadow them. I pray you'd help them make sense of the crazy world in which they live, and may they find purpose for their lives in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. We'll stand to our feet. We're going to sing this last song. If you raised your hand, I want you to do one more thing, and that is step out from where you are standing into the nearest aisle and come stand walk all the way to the front. When you're here, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ as your Savior. We're going to do this publicly, and you're going to find it very encouraging when you do. As we sing, you come. Come now. Come right on all the way up to the front. man. Stand right here. Face it. Just come, come like this. Kind of show everybody what you're doing. Awesome. Come on, man. Awesome.
Yes, sir. Hey, you guys. How are you? Glad you're here. Awesome. So glad you came. God bless you. God love you. Come on. Hey, we don't do this to embarrass anybody. I hope you feel encouraged, those of you who have come. By all that applause, that's for, for what the Lord's doing in your lives. So we hope you feel that encouragement. Now, if there's anybody else, whether you raise your hand or not, whether I saw it or not, that's irrelevant. You know you need to come. Please come on out. Come on out. Come on out. Yeah, love it. Also, you could be watching online. And if you're watching online, you can receive Christ as well. And we're going to put uh, numbers up on the screen. If, you have a, if you're watching maybe by your phone or tablet, you could text 505-509-5433 and just text the word LIFE to 505-509-5433 and we'll respond to you that way. But we're so glad you've come forward. A lot of you have come forward. You know what? This is the most important decision you could ever make in your life, what you're doing right now. Because you're saying no to the devil's lies. You're saying no to darkness. You're saying yes to life and light and salvation and freedom. It's going to feel really good. It's going to be really good. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to pray these words out loud after me. Say them from your heart. Mean them as you say these to God. Say, say this, Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he shed his blood for my sins and that he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heidzig. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.